And welcome back, everybody. It's AZ Update with your hosts, Anthony Bartol and Thomas Maurer. Thomas, how was your week? Fantastic, Anthony. Fantastic. How was yours? Good, good. Dude, that's an awesome hat. Thank you very much. It just came in today. So I was like, hey, you have to have that hat. <laughs> so thank you very much for everybody who's joining us on the show today. Um, quick shout out to everybody that's reached out. We sent out some promo pics on social yesterday. And the first comment we got back was, guys, awesome. You guys are wearing suits. Why are you wearing pajama pants? What's the deal with that? And you know what? It's, it's to relate. You know, we're all in this situation where we're all at home. We're all working from home. Uh, and, you know, business up top and comfortable down below. Um, but the biggest thing, too, is that, you know, a lot of people are coming in and saying, well, you know, even during the feed, why are your eyes shifting back and forth and what have you? We're doing this ourselves, right? This is Thomas and I. We're, we're on the camera. All the equipment is, you know, in my basement, in his, in his kitchen. Uh, and we're, we're doing this ourselves. So when you see us look down or look to the side, it's not because, you know, we're, we're, we're not paying attention. We're actually operating a switchboard in front of us. We don't have a producer. Um, Pierre Roman is in the back, uh, answering your questions on social. Uh, so if you're fo following the AZ, uh, AZ ops hashtag on social, you can, you know, tweet out there or tweet out right on the live stream. Thomas, like, what do you think, man? Like, is awesome that we're, we're in the Blazers and we're, you know, it's comfortable with the, with the, the PJ pants. I can't tell you how much I love doing that with the PJ pants. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is like the most comfortable new show ever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you're absolutely right. I'm sitting currently in my kitchen. Um, you won't believe it. Uh, people like from the production quality, actually people would think, hey, Thomas must be in an awesome studio. <laughs> but no, uh, I actually sitting here in my kitchen currently to record uh, this new show. Now, last week, another show actually called us out. And I know, Thomas, you wanted to talk about that today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, last week was our first episode, right, of the uh, AC Update news show. And um, we had an amazing amount of people in on our show, uh, people watching it, a lot of great comments about it, and, like, people were happy with what we could deliver. And even another new show or another show on YouTube or on Twitch, I think they are. They are still on Twitch. I mean, yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> like, so Patch and Switch is, uh, is uh, picked us up here. Uh, and basically was talking about our show and they were like saying, hey, they did a great job. They're speaking about news in Azure and things like that. Um, however, believe me or not, they mentioned, oh, by the way, they're not as funny as we are. And I was like, we are not trying to be funny here. We are a serious news show here. I even have paper here in front of me, which you can't really see because of that. But there's also nothing written on the paper. But we are a serious news show, and we take this stuff very serious. I, I had to go out and buy my blazer. I still have the tags on. I don't know if I'm supposed to take this off or not. It's, it's you know, this is news, right? So we're trying to report on Azure News, and maybe we're not that funny, or maybe we're not that funny looking. Who knows, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe it's that. Maybe it's that. No, absolutely. So really hope that people enjoyed it. Um, and I think we would right, jump right in into the news, right? Yep, let's jump back into the news. So Thomas, take it away. Okay, so first up this week, we want to talk about some announcements the Azure storage team had to make. And they were talking about new features uh, coming to Azure Archive Storage, right? Uh, they went, it's already general available, and Azure Archive Storage is a great way of you like to store your, obviously, archives and your long-term storage, right? So it's a very, very cheap solution for like storing files. Um, however, it has a couple of catches, right? Where you can basically do everything there um, uh, as you would do on the cold or hot storage, right? Um, so to have, to have that. And so they were working uh, on a couple of improvements. And one of them I really liked was the, now when you upload a uh, a blob to that storage, for example, you can go out and select already like the tier for that, right? So if you're using the API to upload that, you can say, hey, this file I directly upload to archive storage. This one I'm going to directly upload to hot or cold storage. And so there are some amazing changes um, uh, going out there. Um, and there are a lot of other improvements. Again, you can find the link on our blog and in the description below uh, to talk a little bit about more. But Anthony, um, did you see like a couple of people using archive storage? 
Oh yeah. Um, you know, I way back when was in retail, I could see this in terms of historical data being captured from sales receipts uh, and just customer data uh, in something where previous to would be in a, in a storage vault or in a, in a data center on premises, uh, having it up in the cloud in an archived scenario, so much easier in terms of storage, so much the ability to actually store a lot more um, and then to retrieve quickly as required. I remember back in the day pulling sales receipts and what a tedious task it was uh, in you know, utilizing the power of the cloud and having the ability to quickly access and then securely access that data as well. What a huge benefit, you know, to retail. What are, what other um, industries do you see this being utilized in? So the the funny part is that I when this news came out, I was already talking to a friend, right? And my friend is um, like self-employed. He has his own company and he's basically a creator. He does uh, videos for people, pictures and stuff like that. So if you have a wedding or another awesome event going on, he can also do promo videos for um, uh, your company or for your job or your club or whatever. So he does obviously creates a lot of files and media and stuff like that. And currently, uh, a lot of these producers and studios, they basically store that on their hard drives, right? And this is a couple of disadvantages because you have to basically manage the physical drives and the physical storage itself, right? So even if you have some network attached storage or you have a server or whatever, you need to take care of this and manage this. You probably, if you have USB drives, even if they're going up to eight terabytes of storage, um, if you need something from last year, you probably need to find the right USB drive and things like that. So he was looking for finding a solution to basically store that data, basically just when it, like for how long he needs it and basically just on a very cheap level uh, because he doesn't need, need to access it. So um, what people need to understand is that, again, when we have Azure storage, there are multiple tiers. So we have the hot tier, which is um, basically for files which you access very much or change very much, right? So you, you usually, it's a little bit more expensive, it's, but it has more performance. Um, and obviously the price for changes are is a little bit lower. And then if you go to the cold tier, this is still um, on drives, but you basically go out and um, uh, it's not as fast, obviously, as the hot tier. And then even then going further, it's the archival tier. This is like the cheapest tier in terms of uh, storage capacity, but you pay for that if you do a lot of changes on these files, right? Um, and also, obviously, it takes a while until you actually, when you retrieve a file, it actually goes and needs to get that file, and that can take a while. Um, so again, you have these different tiers, and he now can go out and say, hey, these files I'm not going to touch like for a long, long time. So I put this on Azure Archival Storage, and he basically pays a very um, low amount. So uh, wherever you have large amounts of data, um, where you need to store for a very long time um, in a very cheap way. I think that that is Azure storage and cloud storage in general is an absolutely great way of doing that. And then the added benefit too, if you're you know healthcare, if you're legal, if you're finance and you have to abide by specific rules in terms of how the data is actually stored and how the data is accessed, you know, the same ability as you would have with hot data, uh, you would have the ability to apply the rules to the storage data uh, so that you're adhering to the requirements to ensure that you, your certifications to keep in spec. Yep, absolutely. So we also have, I think, options. Uh, I forgot the name about it, but we have options where you basically can go out and you can't really uh, modify the file anymore. So we can just basically upload it and you can change it. And that's very important if you do archives and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of industries have regulations in place, so they make they need to make sure. And I think they're called like warm solutions and stuff like that, if I remember that correctly. Um, where you basically just go out and you can't modify the file anymore. You're, it, it, it should not be possible, right, for legal reasons and stuff like that. So definitely cloud storage, uh, um, again, great what we are doing there. And I see we see a lot of new things coming there uh, in the last couple of months as well. I'm sure we see a lot more in the future as well. Um, but then you also have some interesting news to share, right? Uh, you, I heard you had some news about Identity and Security Center. Yeah, and that's up next. So what's been awesome is that Microsoft has now offer, is now opened the identity management recommendations for the free tier in Azure Security Center. This is big, because prior to this was a, a, a paid uh, scenario. Now it's a solution where via Azure Security Center in a free tier, 
providing you, you know, what you should look into in terms of securing your organization from an identity perspective. So there's an introduction to the blog that's, that's here. And we're going to share all these links uh, on the video and inside of the blog post as well. Um, but what I wanted to call out is a link through to docs.microsoft.com that actually runs through the identity access recommendations that are being made available in the free tier of Azure Security Center. You know, things like, you know, what external accounts can gain access to what data, uh, when multi-factor uh, multi authentication should be utilized. This prior to was a paid service. And so the fact that Microsoft is now opening this up in terms of a free uh, scenario, is, is it's a big deal because the fact that you're now being offered this solution uh, to secure your organization from an identity perspective. We've talked about this before, the whole aspect of your data being the new currency that everybody wants to get their hands on. And so those touch points in terms of individuals accessing that data, you want to prove that they're actually who they say they are. Uh, if you have individuals that are coming from outside, you know, how are you ensuring that they're secured? And and having this from a, from a free scenario, it, it's a best play for everybody in terms of security and for that ability to, you know, we mentioned this last last show, I'm not a security specialist, you're not a security specialist. Uh, Azure Security Center is a, a great tool that provides you that insight in terms of how you can tighten things up to be uh, more secure and address the possible issues that could arise should you not lock everything down. Now in the free tier and opening up the ability to protect uh, for identity management, it, it's a big uh, opportunity for everybody to be more secure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree with you that. And so just to clarify this a little bit for, for our um, uh, viewers on the stream and also for myself. So this means basically if I have Office 365, like if I just sign up to like Office 365 um, and I use like Exchange Online and things like that, I already get obviously Azure AD in the background, right? Um, so I get that um, and have that available there uh, as well. Um, so I heard that there is a little bit of a problem on the stream, by the way, Anthony, with like not hearing you, like we cannot hear you on the stream. So, so what I'm, seems to be what I'm actually bit... hearing is that there's an issue in the stream in terms of audio where on one, so on the left side is my, you can hear myself and on the right side, you can hear Thomas. We apologize. You know, we are not <laughs> professional video producers here. This is our first or actually our second show ever, um, putting this together. We're doing this out of the passion of we want to share information. We're unable to connect with you personally anymore uh, in the current scenario that we're in. Um, hopefully that changes, you know, when everything uh, it becomes available to do so uh, in, in the course of nature, or the course of time that it's going to take. Uh, so please bear with us. Uh, you will have to have both your left and right earbud in if you're listening to us to hear us both. Um, it is something that we're going to address for our third show, and we apologize for the technical difficulties uh, that we may be having. But again, Thomas and I are not professionals at this. This is something that you know I'm doing in my basement. He's in his kitchen. We're trying to get the news out there. We're just going to get better every time we move forward in terms of the show. Um, so back to this okay. new, back to this news here. So yep. You know, so yeah, this is this is a big deal, right? So Azure Active Directory embedded into Office 365. We're not security specialists. We're not video specialists either, apparently. And we have this scenario where um, you know there's pertinent data that that needs to be secured. Um, how yeah. do we you know? Azure Security Center is that offering that is an added bonus, and especially now the fact that they've you know made this available in the free tier to provide insight in terms to what needs to be addressed. It's a clickable solution, right? It's it's providing you this report, and it provides you the links in terms of okay, what are the next steps now to button down uh, your individual's identity on your organization's information? It's the whole aspect of should multi-factor authentication be required throughout the organization? I would say yes, because the fact that it's, it's something that you can make available when you have Azure Active Directory uh, deployed amidst your organization's data access. And so why not, right? And so, yep. it, so being, it, it being a free tier, it's a, it's even better in terms of the yep. availability to report on. So, so it does mean come back to, to that. And basically, if you can't hear Anthony, that's fine as long as you can hear me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know what people um, would say the other the other way around, but it's, let's continue. <laughs> so um, now again, like coming back to that. So I I'm like a small company. I have Office 365, and a lot of people don't know that even if you have Office 365, you have like Exchange Online and all that, you automatically have Azure Active Directory in the back end, right? You already have a tenant and like that. So does that mean now with Azure Security Center like moving those features like to the free tier? 
Does that mean I can basically just have um, Office 365 and then basically go to my Azure um, and, and create there an account and basically start like using Azure Security Center at the free tier and I get all these benefits you just mentioned? So the, the way it works is that, remember, in the Azure Security Center, it's a reporting mechanism, right? It will tell the organization, this is what you need to address in terms of security for identity protection uh, when deploying Azure Active Directory. There are some instances where, you know what, there might be a cost in implementing said rules or said solutions, right? The, the free mechanism yep. is specifically around the reporting. It's, it's specifically around, yep. this is what needs to be addressed yep. in terms of identity management. Okay, but that is already awesome, right? That yes, already I get like, visibility in seeing when like I have only Office 365, I have an Azure AD in the background, but I already get to see like all these recommendations and all those things like, hey, ooh, there is something happening I should take care of, right? Correct. And that's the thing. And then, you know, the challenge, the opportunity, sorry, not challenge, is that not a lot of us are security specialists. And so now this being offered in the free tier to provide you insight in terms of what needs to be addressed is a huge bonus. Yeah, so no, I'm absolutely, and I'm, as I said, I'm like, a, like last show, uh, we talked about it already. I'm a huge fan of Azure Security Center. Actually, I should have a hat which says Azure Security Center. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but seriously, I, I really love what they are doing. And I, I, I think especially in these times where we see more and more companies moving to these like mobile first world where they basically have employees working from anywhere on any devices. I think security becomes more and more important um, uh, to take care of this in, in a new way, right? I mean, I remember the times where you were building uh, those, like, where you basically had this, your own castle, right? Everything outside was bad and everything inside was absolutely fine. So um, I think bringing that down, like, to the endpoints, like, protecting them and basically said, like, in a like, kind of like a zero trust environment, um, uh, where you basically don't care if the employee is in the office or if he's at home or in a coffee shop, um, basically you're saying, hey, there is a potential risk involved, right? And I think that that is even like something which can help companies become even more secure. And I think you hit the nail on the head too, right? And the fact that we're all at home right now, um, you know, we're all uh, self-quarantining. Um, IT's job has just gotten a lot more difficult uh, because of the fact that, you know, we have to make sure that we protect everybody's identity that's accessing remotely. And, you know, tools like Security Center and offering this free tier, offering in the free tier now in terms of, uh, insight and updates and, and reports on how to protect your uh, people and your organization that much more in terms of their identity. Huge bonus uh, in regards to this offering and timely as well. So let's continue yeah. on with the news. Thomas, you're up next. So the next thing I want to talk about is actually a blog post on itopstalk.com. Uh, if you're not familiar with itopstalk.com, you should probably be. Um, it's our team's blog. So it's part of the Azure Cloud Advocates. And our team there blogs about topics which are IT ops, IT pro uh, related, but not only li um, like limited to that, right? We also have topics which are related to developers and like basically all technology person out there in the world. Um, so this t this week we had uh, Sarah uh, Lean from our team writing about things you need to consider when you're actually um, moving and migrating your servers to the cloud, right? So we see a lot of companies actually like doing a lift and shift of their server systems, right? So they're moving um, their virtual machines basically up to Azure. And there are good reasons for that. I don't want to talk too much about this, what the reasons are. Uh, but I want to highlight like one of them, which not a lot of people, for example, know is if you still have Windows Server 2008 and 2008 R2, you can basically go out um, uh, because the reason for that is they're out of support right now, right? So you don't get any security updates for these. So what you can do is actually buy extended security updates. So you get security updates in your on-prem environment. Or B, we give you the options to migrate them to Azure, and then you get extended security updates for free for the next three years, which again, doesn't mean then you don't need to think about modernizing or upgrading these servers, but you win three years of time to do that and plan that correctly. So coming back to the blog post, Sarah mentions that um, there are three things you need to, con especially if you want to highlight three things you need to consider uh, when you migrate and, uh, your servers to the cloud. And when I, wrote, when I was reading that blog post, um, I really was like looking at it and was like thinking, hey, 
that is kind of like the same things we needed to consider and we forgot many many times when we for example were upgrading our virtualization stack right i was like customers when we upgraded from hyper-v 2008 or 2 to windows or to hyper-v 2012 from 2012 um, to for example 2012 r2 and to 2016 and so on so it, it kind of like felt very similar and she highlights like three really important things first of all the operating system uh, so if you're running uh, some legacy operating systems. Keep in mind, not all operating systems are supported in Azure, right? If you have very old versions of, of different operating systems out there, there is a chance that they are not supported in Azure and they probably will not run in Azure, right? As well as in other cloud providers as well. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, you can't just move everything <laughs> to that. And there, I want to quickly highlight Azure Migrate. Azure Migrate is a service which can do an assessment of your on-prem environment, and it also checks if your operating, if the operating systems you're running are actually working on Azure, right? So this is already something we can have a look at. The next thing is mentioned, is mentioned the next two things are basically, are more process-based, right? So you had your on-prem environment, there's a high chance that you had a backup strategy and an update management strategy, right? So you had some automation in place to do updates, and probably you had some you had some backup vendors in there uh, and some different technologies to do backups of OVMs. So when you're actually moving this to the cloud, these are things you need to reconsider, right? You need to think about, hey, how can I um, do backups now since my virtual machines are running in Azure? Um, or how do I do patch management on my virtual machines in Azure? And the great thing about this, we have services for this in Azure itself, right? Uh, so you have Azure Backup to do backups, you have Azure Site Recovery to basically um, do failovers, and then you also have Azure Update Management to manage patches on your servers, right? So really have a look at that as well. And then even though if those services are already in Azure, there are also some third-party solutions in the Azure Marketplace, which you can also leverage. Um, so if you're, for example, looking at different backup vendors, for example, and you're very happy with them, you probably want to keep them around. And there are certain options you can have in the Marketplace um, to do certain things. However, again, as Sarah states in the blog post, you really need to look at it uh, and, and reconsider and redesign it and make sure that the things you do are going to work, right? And it's interesting because this topic comes up over and over and over again. You know, when we were on Microsoft Ignite the Tour, it, it just, it, it people come up to us and say, hey, Thomas, hey, Anthony, we're interested in adopting the cloud. We want to move everything to the cloud. How do we get started? Like, how do we, you know, we just want to move forward and jump to it. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's take a step back, right? Let's, what are the considerations that you have to, to look at in regards to moving to the cloud? Right. And, and this is the thing we've seen all types of verticals come to us at medical, legal, education, you know, retail, um, interested and eager to move to the cloud. But it's like we're just going to do a lift and shift. We're going to we're going to take all our virtual machines. We're going to spin them up into the cloud and we're going to run. And yeah, it's the easiest way to do it. Um, but are you taking into consideration who needs access to your data? What architecture has to be put into play? What are the um, ISO standards or security requirements or HIPAA requirements? You know, there's so much to think about. It's it's just it, a lift and shift is possible, 100%. But make sure you're taking these things into consideration when adopting yeah. cloud. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, as you mentioned, those are those are the things which now, when you when you say it, sound like very obvious, right? <laughs> but I can remember a couple of projects where we were brought in, where people were migrating, like in back in the days, <laughs> from one virtualization uh, level, layer to another one, and they realized, oh no, and we forgot to like think about backup, right? Our backup solution can't is not ready to backup the new virtualization environment, right? They're just don't have to update yet and and things like that so uh, that's very clear and then as you mentioned correctly like there is a lot of like things when you also think about the architecture and about governance in azure right so i highly recommend all everyone who actually moves services to the cloud to have a nice great landing zone concept in place where you actually know okay 
hey, if I migrate that, um, everything is set up the right way. I have my policies in place. I have my naming conventions in place. I have my security <laughs> architecture in place and all of that. Um, I can't stress this enough because this is really coming. Uh, I've seen so many projects failing because people are just like, okay, hey, it's super easy to migrate a VM to the cloud, but you forget of all the other things, right? And you don't think about it and that can cause problems. And then governance too, right? And that's a hot topic right now in terms of cloud adoption. When you have everything secured into your into your data center, you know you have to take that same mentality and same planning structure for cloud adoption. It can't just be carte blanche access to every virtual machine that anybody can go in and, and restart the machine, right? It's something where, and I've heard the horror stories over and over again. Yeah, we moved everything to Azure. Everybody has the same carte blanche access to all the data that's out there. And uh, somebody has been asked, hey, we, you know, our, our, our cloud adoption bills has been too high. Uh, go in and, and start removing services or resources that, we, you know, you feel are not required to save us uh, a couple of dollars. And people will go in and just terminate things. And, and it's like, <laughs> Well, you've just lost six months of data because you didn't understand what this was, right? So, you know, the whole aspect of having access to, to information in the cloud and the ability to spin up architecture in the cloud from either a cloud native or a hybrid implementation is awesome, but proper planning and governance is still required as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that and and I, I agree. I can't agree with you more. <laughs> this is absolutely critical. And again, uh, I, I've worked with so many people who haven't really thought about this. Um, it's also a problem because like, if you get started with cloud, you probably don't know about this, right? You don't know that there are actually guardrails with Azure, with our Azure management as a governance tools um, ready for you to use, right? You only just need to start with it. And one of my favorite examples always I, I bring up is like, uh, that we have these great new MV2 series virtual machines, right? They have like 400 cores, I think up to 12 terabyte of memory, and they drain your credit card in three seconds, right? So if I would be a developer, I mean, my code runs faster on a machine like this, right? So I would always deploy the largest machine I can find. However, obviously the largest machine you can find is probably also the most expensive one. Um, so um, this is also something you can take care of. And I'm not just like, this is one from the cost perspective, but there's so much more, as you mentioned, uh, also coming to like where you have uh, regulatory requirements to just deploy in a certain set of data centers, for example. Um, so again, I'm stressing here very much on the governance part, where actually Sarah was highlighting like some very critical parts on the other side. But again, those are all so many important things to think about when you're actually migrating to the cloud. All right, shall we continue on? Absolutely. I think it's your turn talking about something very interesting when it comes to um, identity. Yep, so we're back into identity management, and this time from our good friend and colleague, uh, Sonia Cuff, uh, back on itopsoc.com. She's written an article uh, that's discussing the differences between identity protection and conditional access. And this is something where, you know, people adopting Azure Active Directory have to take in consideration and have to get a little bit more depth on in terms of the services itself. It's not just about, you know, enabling access to information and resources. It's also protecting the individuals that have access to this data as well. Remember, your information, your data is the new currency. People want to have access to that. People want to sell that to the highest bidder. And you want to make sure that you're governing over in terms of who has access to what. And you're also proving out that these individuals are who they say they are. You know, I remember back in the day of my in my days of IT, where individuals would share uh, user accounts, and so you know, you want to stop that uh, from happening. And so, it's not just enough to put, you know invoke conditional access and say, you know, you have the rights to access this virtual machine or this data data storage, uh, or you have the ability to ad uh, administer this machine. It's not just end users that this applies to anymore. This is also administration as well and auditing rules in terms of who has access to what. So Sonia does a phenomenal job breaking down in terms of the considerations around identity protection and what that means in Azure Active Directory and what you should take uh, what you should take into consideration when looking at this from a perspective of adoption of Azure Active Directory for the solution, and then looking at the the, the um, differences or the abilities that are available through conditional access. 
and the you know what can you actually invoke or enable once you've proven out that this individual is who they say they are uh, and you've protected them to say you know this is Anthony Bartolo this is what he has access to uh, in terms of our architecture and our data sets now with conditional access going forward and say, yep, this individual has the ability to reboot the machine. Uh, this individual has the ability to create resources. This, this individual has, you know, the ability to set this all up because we've, you know, verified who they are. And now through conditional access, do they have the ability to go forward and access said data? Yeah. And this, you know, ties in really well in regards to what we just talked about, you know, it, it, the whole ability to manage out, uh, access into the cloud it, it, it's so much more robust than what i used to experience back in the day with an on-premises implementation right and it has to be because of the fact that your data is everywhere and so doing more to protect also does more to enable as well yeah no i i again i'm a huge fan of um of conditional access and all all that stuff we have there i mean i also realized like it's not just about like your identity, right? Who you are, or it's also about like which machine are you working on, right? The difference of like, hey, I'm on my corporate managed device. I can log in and work on these files. But if I'm on my phone, for example, it says, okay, hey, this is not company managed. You log in with your account. You definitely have like from your account wise, you have permissions. But since you're, since we don't consider your mobile phone in our case, for example, as secure, um, we don't allow you to edit that file, right? Or download that file. Um, so you, same thing with like different places, right? If you're at home or if you're in the company, um, then it's absolutely fine to access files, to do have the certain permissions. But if we realize you're probably now in a, uh, uh, like in a cafe, uh, coffee shop or something like that, and um, we don't want to give you internet, uh, like we don't want to give you access to this file, we can also do this, right? So the, there is basically endless possibilities how you can um, secure your data and you secure your accounts as well in your environment. I, I've seen organizations go as far as conditional access. So we will allow you the ability to access data from your devices as so long as you're inside of the building. Uh, once you've walked out the front doors of the building, all devices that you had access to said data no longer work. In geofencing's perspective, I've seen it done from a perspective of, you know, from the Wi-Fi router itself uh, down to even GPS coordinates of the devices that you're actually trying to access through. Nice, nice. Now, there definitely is some good stuff uh, out there uh, in terms of, of, of the security features. And it also applies to even the software running on your device, right? So if you have an Intune sanctioned device or using a third party uh, mobile device management suite and implement in the device, there could be, there's an availability for a check for that to ensure that, yep, this device has been blessed by the organization to gain access to this data. It's been registered. We, we know of it. We know that it's secured because it's being managed by the organization itself. And that also applies to bring your own devices as well. And, you know, it is something where uh, there would be a client that would be loaded on your machine that you actually own. But if it's something that you want to utilize to gain access to the organization's data, it's something that you would have to move forward with and allow for that organization to have uh, access or to deploy said applications to ensure your device is secure, then that too will also, you know, in terms of conditional access, allow you or disallow you access to said data. Yeah. No, again, fantastic, fantastic uh, technologies we have there. And again, I don't think this is so new, right? This is not something which is um, like just out of the gate, right? Uh, I think we just talked about a couple of different improvements and stuff like that. But there are companies out there, they're using that already for a long time, right? Yeah, and that's the thing, right? So this is the evolution uh, of, you know, access or conditional access coming from on-premises into the cloud, seamless in a hybrid or cloud native scenario. Um, and again, timely in the fact that we're all working from home right now and the ability to gain access to said data securely, huge bonus, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So let's, let's continue on. Uh, Thomas, I know you wanna talk about a big event that's currently happening right now. Yeah, so in our what's going on uh, section, basically, we have this week, and it's currently running right now, um, the Global Azure Virtual 2020 event, right? Um, people are probably familiar, again, I think we mentioned that in our last show last week, uh, with the Azure Global Bootcamp. And those were usually like a one-day event, like 
around the world where different communities come together and learn together Azure. Now this year, thing, things are a little bit different. Um, uh, obviously, we can't do in-person events. Um, so what the organizer does, and again, those are all uh, people from the community, right? This is not Microsoft organizing it. There are many Microsoft speakers helping out with sessions and, and interviews and stuff like that. But again, this is completely organized by the community around the world, right? Uh, and they are running now, uh, yesterday, they're running today, and they will run tomorrow uh, as well with some awesome sessions and live shows and, again, different communities around the world. Um, I highly recommend that you go to globalazure.net um, where you find more information. You also find the link to the virtual event. There's also a, like, a global live stream going on where they do interviews and talks with interesting guests. So, for example, today I know that they will have the um, Natalia from the Azure Stack team uh, in the in those in that live show, uh, and we'll interview about what's going on with Azure Stack and our hybrid uh, story. Um, so, you have last yesterday I saw that they interviewed a Microsoft MVP, Sami Laiho, uh, which was talking about security in these times and trainings he does. Super interesting stuff going on there. So I highly recommend you have fantastic hosts there as well. Um, so definitely recommend that you look out for the global Azure virtual 2020 event. And this is awesome too, right? Because this is not run by Microsoft. This is a community initiative that is worldwide uh, in this time and in, in, in this age that we are connecting to everybody through uh, technology. Uh, the ability for like-minded individuals and individuals that, you know, have great ideas to share that, to share their passions, to share their, you know, insights in terms of cloud community, cloud connection, cloud computing. Um, people willing to share their knowledge. We can't meet in person, unfortunately, but to continue on with that sharing, to continue on with that learning, being a learn it all, absorbing. Like I, I've been attending a lot of the sessions. I attended your session yesterday. It's been great in terms of this is not just, you know, learning directly from, you know, docs at Microsoft.com or other Microsoft resources. This is real world implementation that's happening uh, in the field from, you know, organizations as, as large as, you know, uh, Fortune 500 cor uh, corporations to small, uh, small uh, medium sized businesses as well around the world, North America, Europe, Asia, you name it. It's, it's been phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen there are like like events in the UK going on, UK and Ireland. I saw like Serbia, a Balkan event. I saw events in the US, as you said, in Asia. Um, I really love what people are doing um, there. And again, this is, as you said, it's, it's from the community for the community. And I love the passion those people have to share their knowledge. And what I also want to highlight, it's not just sessions, right? It's not just everything is like one way, like one way direction presented. It's really that they have different formats. So there will be discussions, interviews, you can have chats. Um, I have seen many, many like different events and, and live streams doing different kind of like learning. And that's, and that's what I love about this, right? Like I'm definitely a hands-on learner. Uh, there, I've seen hands-on labs that people are walking individuals through. Um, the, bu the bug hunt is another big one as well, where you have an individual leading the hunt uh, in terms of bugs, in terms of uh, services that are available, and then producing that, you know, in terms of a report uh, to the engineering teams at Microsoft in terms of, hey, this needs to be addressed. This is what we've come up in terms of bugs that we've learned in terms of a community. Uh, there's a lot of things, you know, in perspective of creation of services, we don't know it all, right? And, and we want to hear from the community in terms of what needs to be addressed in terms of what can make things better, what can make people's lives easier. Um, I know a lot of the features that are being added on to a lot of the services that are made available are definitely requests that are coming out from around the world. And that's why, you know, when community events like these uh, occur, we're so appreciative uh, and we love participating because we learn so much from you, uh, the community, in terms of what do you actually need in cloud computing? Yep, absolutely. Oh, that, that's a fantastic point that you bring this up. Um, one thing I realized when I joined Microsoft, I mean, I, I've I always heard Microsoft talking about how important feedback is, 
But when I joined Microsoft, I actually realized how important it really is, right? Um, we take that very, very serious. And I had the opportunity um, on our IT Ops talk in our Azure Unblocked show to talk to uh, Holly Lehman, which is part of the CXP team, which takes care of uh, feedback around uh, Azure services. And she kind of like explained me what are the processes, how does feedback work inside Microsoft, how we actually bring that back to the engineering teams, how we have a look at that data, how, how we use that data to make sure that, hey, this is something people really want. This is something people need, right? So we are actually taking that. And like my experience really, to tell you the truth, it can sometimes take a little bit of time until you see that feature pop up, right? It's not that we can just go out and like do something tomorrow. Sometimes it needs a little bit of time. And that is what like to some of our members in the community feels a little bit like ah, they're not listening. But that's actually I can confirm this that this is not true. We are really listening and the teams are listening. Um, all of the all of the product group members I, I met, they're really interested in customer feedback. and They really want to know what they can improve to make the lives of all, everyone out there easier. Case in point, you know, even in the midst of this stream itself, we're, we're getting individuals that are on the uh, chat panel uh, talking about, you know, their adoption of the technologies and what they'd like to see better. Uh, I've seen a, a great uh, IM coming from Gus, uh, or sorry, Guru, uh, who's talking about, you know, the whole Azure archival storage in their organization using it for uh, closed captioning television uh, amidst their organization. So I'm, I'm guessing that's the security uh, offering that they have. Um, they are actually using that for, for storage. And I, I'm curious in terms of, you know, their experiences in pulling up archival data that is video. Uh, what has been, you know, and, and definitely inside of the chat window, if you want to you want to comment on that, uh, Mr. Guru, uh, if you can let us know in terms of your experience uh, with regards to, you know, retrieving uh, video data uh, from your closed captioning tel television, I'm, I'm guessing it would be your security system. Uh, how has that experience been? And, and, you know, let us know. We want to continue on the conversation beyond just the weekly show. This is, you know, our show to talk about, you know, and, and the news that we come that comes across our table. But we do this to have the conversation with you, the community, uh, to share what we've learned, and then we want to learn from you in terms of how are you adopting, what would you like to see better. This is, you know, what I love about this initiative that we're we're putting forward on this. It's a two-way conversation, you know. We're not just here on Friday. We don't just exist on Friday. We're available online. We're available on social. Uh, we're available through a whole barrage of, of platforms. Feel free, connect with us, comment, make suggestions. You know, we would love to hear your feedback and your input. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, let's continue on to the uh, MS, MS Learn uh, module of the week. Sound good? Yeah, absolutely. I heard you selected a great one this week again. Yep. So this week, uh, we talked a lot about Azure Active Directory, and there's a lot of indiv uh, individuals out there that, you know, how do I get started? How do I start learning? You know, especially those that are looking to move from on-premises to in a hybrid implementation. Uh, this is a great fundamentals learning path uh, that'll walk you through the considerations of Azure Active Directory. Now, to get to here, it's aka.ms forward slash learn, uh, gets you to our Microsoft Learn offering. Uh, and it's probably one of the, the top ones that come up in terms of uh, accessing information or accessing um, learnings on Azure Active Directory. Uh, again, goes through the whole fundamentals aspect in terms of what you need to take in consideration for um, adoption uh, and proper management. What I love about Microsoft Learn is the whole ability that everything is hands-on. I'm one of those individuals that you know wanna go through and practice uh, and understand through implementation. And in doing so, utilizing Microsoft Learn, it's done for free using their sandbox technology. What does that mean? It takes Azure, it creates an account uh, that allows you inside of the sandbox to you know, run through hands-on labs that are at no cost to you. It's a completely free resource. So this week, you know, we want to bring attention to this in terms of Azure Active Directory because there was so much about it in the news this week uh, so that you can go forth and actually start playing with the implementation and understanding what the Azure Active Directory offering has to offer. Yeah, no, and I, I again, I can just like amplify this again. Um, like what happens to me very often is like, hey, there's a free trial for some sort of service. 
uh, and then you say, okay, that's actually good. I want to try this. And then the first thing you need to do is like enter your credit card. And like, yeah, and even though <laughs> right. I'm not going to do that. And with Microsoft Learn, that's absolutely not the case, right? No credit card required. You just can go out uh, and use the Learn platform and you can use our sandbox technology to basically try out things in Azure. And I, I, I believe that this is amazing. By the way, I'm using Learn and Docs a lot to prepare for Microsoft exams, right? So when I'm currently doing any Microsoft exams, I'm using that platform. I'm not using something different. I'm really using that platform to get to learn about it uh, and to prepare for exams as well. Or also, if I'm just like interested in a topic, right? If there is anything I'm interested, it doesn't necessarily be, you need to be an exam. If I now want to learn more about the identity stuff, I'm definitely going to check out um, Microsoft Learn um, because they cover so much about it and in a such communicable way you can actually learn about it, right? Oh yeah, 100%. And, and that's the thing, I'm preparing for uh, writing of exams as well. Um, in the fundamentals uh, exam that I wrote, you know, Microsoft Learn was a huge resource for me uh, to go through in the, in the hands-on, um, looking at more of the security certification right now and that's why I'm actually going through the Azure Active Directory uh, fundamentals just to get my uh, feet wet again and getting into the into the rhythm in terms of uh, absorption of content and, and again i learn hands-on so it's been a phenomenal tool for me uh thomas we are at time uh with the show uh anything else you want to add for this week no i think that is it was absolutely awesome to be here again this week i really hope um that everyone will tune in again next week for our next friday episode of the azure uh update show and again, it was a pleasure to be here with you, Anthony, again. Um, see you soon. Yeah, and see you soon. And remember, those of you that are watching, this is a two-way conversation. Please feel free to comment in the comment sections below or on the blogs that we've shared with you today or via social using the hashtag AZOps. Uh, with that, we are signing out for episode two, and we'll see you next week. Cheers, all.